Hello there. Let me start this week with A Course in Miracles. What I see is a form of vengeance. The world I see is hardly the representation of loving thoughts. It is a picture of attack on everything and by everything. It is anything but a reflection of the love of God and the love of His Son. It is my own attack thoughts which give rise to this picture. My loving thoughts will save me from this perception of the world and give me the peace God intended me to have. And hello to you wherever you are. Let's start at the Priory with C.S. Knott. He says, I was told to work with Olgivana. We pulled one at each end of a cross-cut saw, cutting up logs for the winter and piling them up in the woodsheds. She told me about their life in the Caucasus with Gurdjieff. In Tiflis he had asked her if she had a wish, a real wish. She said, I wish for immortality. He said, what you do now? I look after my house and servants, she replied. You work yourself, cook, look after baby? No, my servants do that. You do nothing, and you wish for immortality, I, he said. But this does not come by wishing, but by special kind of work. You must work, make effort for immortality. Now I will show you how to work. First, tell servants to go, and begin by doing everything yourself. He did show me, she added. He showed me how to do ordinary housework, not as a servant would do it, but to work and at the same time use his method. For two weeks we pulled at the long saw, and every day Gurdjieff came round and watched us. This episode of soaring made a great and lasting impression on me because of what happened at the end, which again came as a result of the months of work. I began to notice that I was experiencing something different while doing this physical work, something that I had never experienced in my long years of the labouring life. Then one day Gurdjieff came along on his daily visit, and while he was watching me carrying in the wood and piling it, something in me said, I am sensing myself, I am remembering myself. This awareness of increased consciousness was accompanied by a feeling of real joy. Then he said, Enough, I think. You now know very well how to work with wood. I give you new task. It's an interesting little episode. What I see here is that Gurdjieff, observing C.S. Not could see that there was reconciling flowing out of C.S. Knot as he was working. Enough, I think, he says. Why? Why not carry on with that? In order to be secure, you have to learn many things. You have to learn how to survive in the winter, in the spring, in the summer, in the autumn, you have to know what to do. Only then can you survive. Only then can you last. As you well know, most people who are interested in Gurdjieff have decided that they don't want to do any work at all. So they just sit in their backside reading, talking about self-remembering or whatever. This world is full of forgetfulness and this world likes to forget. It likes to not exist, maybe even the planet herself. I was thinking this week about how women in the West would try very hard to be pleasing for their suitors, 
for their future husbands. They really wanted to please him. Why? What does it mean? And in the Roman Empire, for instance, in the world of tradition, people wanted to please their gods. They would do anything, they would sacrifice their life to please their gods. Why? What is the meaning of that? Isn't it that they wished for a higher energy to flow through them and to perform their part in these cosmic cycles? either in a marriage or in the cycle of man and the heavens above. Isn't that really what it means? Real material energetic flows are translated into cultural ideas. How they are formed up in ceremonies and music and particular costumes and dress. But underneath it all, there are real energetic flows. This week I was taught something quite shocking about forgiveness. Which is that we have to be forgiven even by the insane, even by the carnal and low nature of this world. Even that has to forgive us. Otherwise, if it doesn't, there's a tether there, a karmic tether. We live in a world with people who sometimes are motivated by low things, and they may be sincere in their way at their level, but inside are hungry wolves, are mad dogs, are all sorts of things, different characters, different animals. That's what is at the heart of that person. And they may hold a grudge on you. They may not forgive you. They may hold tight to a karmic tether to you. And you have to find a way to get them to let go. And it's not about justice. It's not about understanding the objective truth. It's not about saying, oh, you see that wrong. All those things we've been taught, you know, that life is about the objective truth. It's not that simple, you see. Somebody who can deal with that yearning for an objective truth is somebody of a higher ilk. But many people are not like that. And so the way is, to try and see the way of this person, their journey, and to respect it, and to communicate with them in that place. This created a, a big change inside me, in my understanding of things. That many people are struggling and suffering and journeying underneath the threshold of justice. And they live in their own way. And if you want to meet them and be released by them, you have to enter into their way with them. We have been taught, we have to accept people. What does that even mean? You see, life is always um, feeding, uh, transferring information. There is nothing that sits idly by. If two things of any scale, in any world, sit side by side, they are not doing nothing. There is nothing that does nothing. Everything is alive. Everything is transferring information. So the idea of accepting, it's like um, inebriation. You promise that you won't notice. You promise that you don't care. You promise that nothing will happen and everybody will be safe. That's not how life is at all. In the same way, freedom, which is something that the falling Western people now claim was always their society. It wasn't. Freedom existed in the West because it was a traditional society. It was a tree. 
and the branches were slowly growing at the end illuminated and this structure this tree sheltered a world in itself the white christendom and under its arms was freedom and there is no freedom outside of that because there is no tree outside of that today i was playing a role but i was using it to dislodge a very deeply entrenched character of mine and perhaps those characters would be the ones that get a bit twisted who have cunning that kind of thing and the way i do it is simply to activate it by remembering a particular event and you can hear it start to move and to talk inside of you and you can observe it and then you can stop and then you can activate it again, for instance. And uh, for a lot of these characters, that's enough to dislodge them. For those that are deeply entrenched, it's not going to be quite enough. And that's when you play a role. So then you sort of adopt the posture, the feeling, the energy, the voice. You kind of act it out. And it's like you, you enter into it. You enter into the spirit of it and by doing that you make a connection with it one minute inside one minute outside one minute observing it one minute resting let's hear from Gurdjieff talking about seeking the more a man studies the obstacles and deceptions which lie in wait for him at every step in this realm, the more convinced he becomes that it is impossible to travel the path of self-development on the chance instructions of chance people, or the kind of information culled from reading and casual talk. At the same time, he gradually sees more clearly, first a feeble glimmer, then the clear light of truth which has illumined mankind throughout the ages. The beginnings of initiation are lost in the darkness of time, where the long chain of epochs unfolds. Great cultures and civilizations loom up, dimly arising from cults and mysteries, ever-changing, disappearing and reappearing. After a certain time has elapsed, the centers of initiation die out one after another and the ancient knowledge departs through underground channels into the deep, hiding from the eyes of the seekers. The bearers of this knowledge also hide, becoming unknown to those around them, but they do not cease to exist. From time to time, separate streams break through to the surface showing that somewhere deep down in the interior, even in our day, there flows the powerful ancient stream of true knowledge of being. To break through to this stream, to find it, this is the task and the aim of the search, for having found it, a man can entrust himself boldly to the way by which he intends to go. Then there only remains to know in order to be and to do. Perhaps the only positive result of all wanderings in the winding paths and tracks of occult research will be that, if a man preserves the capacity for sound judgment and thought, he will evolve that special faculty of discrimination which can be called flair. He will discard the ways of psychopathy and error and will persistently search for true ways. Every seeker dreams of a guide who knows dreams about him but seldom asks himself objectively and sincerely, is he worthy of being guided? Is he ready to follow the way? Go out on one clear starlit night to some open space and look up at the sky, at those millions of worlds over your head. Remember that perhaps on each of them swarm billions of beings similar to you or perhaps superior to you in their organization. Look at the Milky Way. The Earth cannot even be called a grain of sand in this infinity. It dissolves and vanishes, and with it you. Where are you? And is what you want simply madness? 
there's a war on in the Middle East, and I'll simply tell the truth. A hundred years ago, there were ten Arabs for every one Jew, and under pressure from America, the beginning of the process of removing all the Arabs from the land began, and today it's getting closer to completion. How long will it be before Palestine has been fully removed? Some people say that the Second World War and the destruction of France, Germany and Britain was for the same end, just like the destruction of Iraq and Libya. How much has to be destroyed? In the Jewish tradition, there is an idea that the Israelites have to return to the Holy Land in complete harmony with their neighbours, so that one day they can be a light unto nations. But after what's happened in the last hundred years, how would it ever be possible for them to become a light unto nations? Now I was just reading some articles about transgender rabbis in the ancient world and the present. It reminds me that Gurdjieff said that there is a certain time for something to be done. For instance, for moving from the sixth to the seventh, or to simply accept the light of Christ. After all, if you are the chosen people and you go to Europe or to North America and see the way these people live at the pinnacle of society, what does that mean for you? Now at some point you simply have to say, this is the way, the truth and the light. Now let me finish with one more story from Gurdjieff. It's from 1936, Tuesday, December the 22nd. We look at the lighted tree. We look at 35 boxes. There is roast turkey, a pig's head, a special herring from England come, but is Jewish from Russia. Miss Gordon's health is drunk. Your health, also health of all Jewish who create such thing. You not part Jew, but all Jew, because you are Scotch. Scotch is all Jew. You know every race in every country seven kind of people have. Tartar, English, French, etc. But Jew have 49 kind in each country. A legomenism exists that tells. Until last age, no cleaner people exist than Jew. Never they mix. If marry outside, then all children from such mixing must die. Such law was. Clean people, very special. Canary says the Bible called them God's chosen people. God not interest such business. Always among many idiots, one super idiot exists. He more idiot than ordinary, therefore he is super center of gravity. In this case, Moses was such, and he make them chosen, not God.
Without a face, eyes without a face. 